Well, good morning. Happy 4th of July weekend. Is everybody going out of town this Tuesday? It's a weird day to have 4th of July, it seems like. Well, boy, I am happy to be here today. It is a beautiful day outside, and I am glad that we get to spend just a half hour together. I'm going to keep it short today so we can jump out into it and enjoy it. And don't hold me to that because I'm probably lying. So we're going to move along with the Numb series today. Last week, if you were here, we talked about becoming numb to self and how life can just become the same routine over and over and over again, and we can just become numb. And becoming numb to self is usually caused by focusing on ourselves. And when we're focused on ourselves, we don't focus on other people. And when we don't focus on other people, we inevitably become numb to our own needs. And it just is a downward death spiral of inward focus. But today I want to look at something a little bit different. I want to talk about the comparison game. The game we all love to play. That helps us become even further numb to ourselves. Because we're numb to other people and what they are like. And we compare ourselves over and over again to other people. And if you've you heard that song before, it's a great song uh, by 21 Pilots. Um, the, the lyrics are this, my name's Blurry Face, and I care what you think. Wish we could turn back time to the good old days when our mama sang us to sleep, but now we're stressed out. That song has over a billion views on YouTube. It connects with people. Those lyrics connect with people. Because we get caught up in the comparison game. We start to think that we could, we wish we could turn back time. We wish we could go back to the good old days. I don't know about you, but man, back in the good old days, the worst thing that could happen to you is you got grounded. Now when my wife tells me to go to the room, I'm like, yes. <laughs> but, but we want to go back because time was so much simpler then. We compare all kinds of things. We compare where we're at now to the good old days, to how things were and how we want them to be that way. We, we compare today with yesterday and with yesterday we compared then to yesterday and on and on and on. And we always think that where we were was better than where we are. And we compare time. We compare what we have with what others have. We look at the things that they own and the, the houses that they're in and the cars that they drive. And we think, man, if I could just have that. Now, I know it sounds the same, but it's, it's very different. We compare what we lack with what others have. So now we see that other people have things, and we go, well, I don't have that, but even then I don't have something that's comparable. How is that? How is my life so much worse than them, and I try so hard to be so good, and I just, I don't have the really nice car. I don't have the really nice house. We compare. We compare what we lack with what others have. We compare what we have with what we feel we deserve. We have things, they're good things, but we think, man, we only have a two-slice toaster. What if we had a four-slice toaster? We're never satisfied with the things that we have. We're always looking to get the better one. I started building a fish tank at home, and I'm doing fancy goldfish, and I love goldfish. They're just very simple, but they're very nice, and you know, I'm not into all the fancy stuff, but... The, the, the goldfish themselves are great because there's so many different ones. And I have these two that are great. They have really great personalities. They're really good fish. But I'm always looking for the next one. And you come to find out that in this hobby, you can get really nice fish for $500. <laughs> Could you imagine paying $500 for a goldfish? I can. And I probably will. Because I want the really nice one, right? I'm not satisfied with the ones that I have. You know, if I had this one and those colors and those fins, it would look so much nicer in my tank. And we just always are trying to level up, trying to get to the next level over and over again with everything that we have, whether it's our two-slice toaster or our fish tank or our cars or the garage that we park them in. We always want something better. We compare what we have with what we feel we deserve. And boy, do we think we deserve it. I worked for the money, and now I'm going to spend that money on what I want to, because I deserve it. I worked hard. Now I'm going to get some things that I want. We compare how happy we are with how happy others are. So now we're not only comparing things, we're saying even though that they don't have anything, why are they so happy? We get upset because my life just isn't as joyful as them, and they have very little. And I'm trying to get more so I can be happier, but it's just a self-defeating process. And then you know those people that do have everything and they're still happy and you go, what? They have nothing and they're happy and they have everything and they're happy and here I sit in the middle and I'm not happy. 
So we compare our happiness, our levels of joy with other people's, with what they do have and what they don't have, and then how they receive those things. We compare our bodies with other people's bodies. That's a big thing. That's a huge chunk of where we live in, in, our, in our country here and how we just aspire so much to have the perfect body. Not everyone can be married to a guy such as myself. But you'll get there. What are you laughing for? When we compare those things, right? We always think if I could just look like that guy, if I could just have her hair or her eyes, maybe if I, if I could just get those clothes. It's such a huge part of our world. And this is the biggest thing that we compare with people. It's even bigger than comparing the things that we own. We compare the ways that we look, something that's so impossible to change unless you have enough money, and then you can. But we want to look a certain way so we can feel a certain way. And, you know, we've got things like this, people's sexiest man alive. They do it every year because you can only be the sexiest man alive for a year, I guess. <laughs> After that, it's move on to new things. We want to be like them. We want to, we want to be like these guys, don't we, men? We, we think that, well, this is going to go away someday, and then I'll look exactly like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. We try to be those things. You know, I was, I was looking into this, and it's kind of an interesting process, and I found an article that talked about how they pick who the sexiest man alive is. I went a little something like this. It says, according to this 2010 interview with ABC News, Larry Hackett, people managing editor, tried to debunk some myths surrounding the annual decision of who is the sexiest man alive. He said, we know it has to be a mix of someone who's hot, but well-known. Not too young, not too old, and somebody who, frankly, maybe we haven't thought of. He continued, sexy certainly has to do with someone being good-looking and has to do with a certain kind of romantic, flirtatious, physical appeal that may be beyond just academic appreciation of the way they look. We want some mystery in our sexiness. Men, how many of those boxes did you check? <laughs> we look and we want to compare to those things. I, I, I melted it down so we can, we can see what the requirements of the sexiest man alive are. You have to be hot. You have to be well-known, but not obviously well-known. We can't just pick the most popular guy. Not too young, not too old. You got to be good-looking. You have to have romantic physical appeal flirtatious physical appeal. I don't even know what that is. And you have to be mysteriously sexy. <laughs> like, like people are guessing whether you are or not. <laughs> so how many of those did you check? How many of those you got nailed down? You see, we compare and we strive to have these things. And man, women, you have it way worse off. There is standards for women that is just ridiculous. And I don't know how you guys put up with it. <laughs> I mean, uh, the makeup industry is worth $382 billion across the world. On average, women will spend $43 per shopping trip on makeup alone. That's why my wife goes three times a week. Individually, women will spend $15,000 a year on makeup alone. $15,000 a year. Because we just strive to look like something we want. Now, don't get me wrong. When it comes to men looking good and women looking good, if the bar needs paint and paint it. <laughs> That's totally fine. I have nothing against looking good. But man, when we compare ourselves to other people, we really start to not appreciate ourselves. And you know, men, we have it so much easier, right? When we don't try to look good, we inherently look good, I guess. We become rustic or war-torn or rugged, weathered. And you know what? Those terms do not translate. I called my wife weathered this morning. <laughs> not a good thing. We compare so much of ourselves with other people. And you know what? The one that always gets us is when we compare our sins with other people's sins. We compare the things that we do that we don't like with the things that other people do that we don't like. And we say, at least I'm not doing those things that I don't like. And comparisons will just stem out from there. Even though we may be comparing our bodies to other people, it's ultimately because we feel dissatisfied with ourselves. 
You don't like yourself. You compare yourselves to other people. That's when it happens. When you don't like the sin and the junk in your life and the problems and the decisions that you make, you ultimately will look at other people and go, at least I'm not making those decisions. At least I don't look that way. And we compare. And when we compare, we become numb to ourselves even further because now we're admitting that we're not satisfied with where we are or what we're doing. And we need to look at other people to give ourselves validation. We play the comparison game. And the comparison game is not a fun game because more often than not, when you're comparing yourself with somebody else, it is apples to oranges. It's two different things. It's completely different. And it only serves to make you feel worse about yourself. Comparison game has no winners. It only has losers. Because we get so caught up with it. We lose sight of ourselves and what the world is telling us to do just, just empties us even further. It's funny because the comparison game is also in the Bible in several places. They were not without this issue either. And there was a great story right after the resurrection here where Jesus had come back, he had been resurrected, and he was talking to the apostles. And he was talking specifically to Peter. And Peter was asking him questions. And Jesus decided to tell him something. He said this. He said, I tell you the truth. He's talking to Peter. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. So Jesus was prophesying Peter's death. That's what he was telling him. He was saying, this is what's going to happen to you. People are going to take you where you don't want to go. You'll stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. He was telling them, this is some bad stuff that's going to happen to you. Prepare yourself. And without fault, Peter, Peter says this. Peter says, he turned around and saw behind them the disciples... Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? So Peter asked Jesus, he said, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. He was so quickly distracted by comparing himself to other people that he lost sight of what Jesus was trying to teach him in the moment. He's saying, if I want that guy to live forever, fine. Don't worry about him. Worry about you. Follow me. Are you doing that? Are you doing a good job of that? Where are you at right now? Stop pointing to him. And we get so caught up in the comparison game that we don't even realize that we're doing it. Ultimately, Jesus was asking the question, am I enough? Seriously, Peter, am I enough? Am I enough that I would tell you this? That life could go in such a way that you're not looking forward to it because it's going to be bad. Am I still enough for you to keep going? Or are you going to waste your time comparing your situation with other people's? Am I enough? That's the question Jesus was asking. See, when you play the comparison game, you always lose. You never win when you play the comparison game. Because when you compare yourself with other people, when you say, look at them, what are they going through? You ultimately take focus away from yourself and the fact that you have some things that you need to work on. And you become more and more numb to that. And you stop seeing, you start, you stop seeing that you're the problem at all. Do you have anybody in your life that you know of who always isn't wrong? Who never has a problem? It's always somebody else's fault. I didn't get in trouble because of me. I got in trouble because of them. And they made me do this and they made me do that. You see, because you become numb over time to your own responsibilities, when you compare yourself to other people, when you compare your situation to other people, when you compare where you're at in life with where other people are at in life, and when you do that, you will lose. There's another great story. Another great story in the Bible. Jesus had just been crucified. He'd been crucified between two thieves. Now, if you know this story, you know about the two thieves. In fact, what you're thinking probably is that there was one good thief and there was one really bad thief. And the good thief said, hey, you know, I want to spend eternity with you. He decides to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, yes, on this day, you will spend eternity in heaven with my father. You think that you got the one side and you got the other one. You got the good thief, you got the bad thief. But you know what? What's interesting is if you read it, if you read it in Luke... They are the same at the beginning. It says that they both 
were shouting jeers at him. They were both saying, look at this guy. We're not as bad as him. Look what he, this was a man who had basically had his flesh ripped from his body, who'd been beaten to where they couldn't even recognize him. And here he was hung between them. And initially they both go, well, at least I don't got it this bad. While they're being hung on the cross to die too. They still compared themselves to the man in the middle. Now, of course, eventually, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the one thief sees that, and he realizes, wow, this is a big deal. And he changes his tone. And he says, hey, man, remember me. And some people will take that moment, and they'll go, what? That's not fair. Where's the justice in that? Here's a man who had lived his whole life apart from God, his whole life apart from Jesus, never had any of that stuff that we know of, and yet at the last second, at the midnight hour, he gives his life to Christ, and Christ says, you will spend eternity in heaven. Is that fair? Is that justice? And we love to look at that and go, no, that wasn't fair. How did he get to live his whole life like that, and then one day just pop right before the 12th hour, he's gone, and he gets to spend eternity in heaven. That's not fair. You see, we demand justice as a means to elevate ourselves. And God does not view us in that way. You see, when it comes to us demanding justice for other people as so to elevate ourselves and make our situation not look as good, how is it that we want to demand justice in that moment? Shouldn't we demand mercy and grace from a God who would spare someone, from a God who would look at that moment and go, I know what you're thinking. I know you've lived my whole part of, your whole life apart from me, but I'm going to serve justice on you and you can't spend eternity with me. Isn't that so much different? Because there's going to be a moment in our lives where we hit the dirt for the last time and we're going to hope and pray that we have a God that's filled with mercy and grace and not justice. But see, when we compare other people, when we demand justice at that moment, we're only saying we're not satisfied with the current situation. I've been trying too hard to be a good person. I've been trying too hard to be a good Christian. And I can't believe someone like that would get in at the last minute, having done nothing like I did. And there again, we've entered the comparison game. We've been caught up in it. And we will lose. Because the comparison game has no winners. There's a moment in the Bible, too, where Jesus was telling a parable. He was talking about the man with all the workers. And these workers are kind of lined up. I, I used this picture because I thought that was appropriate. I, it's almost like, um, almost like everybody's just waiting to get a job. And I think that's kind of the way that it was. That's the way that the, the story is told. That there's all these people, and it's in a particular area. I, I, I think it was at a Home Depot. And they were all waiting to get work. They're all waiting for someone to come up and pick them up and take them to, to work. So here's this man who has decided to pay a denarius, which was a whole day's wage, for his workers to come to his farm and work for him. So in the morning, he goes and he picks up a bunch of workers. He takes them there and they start working. And then in the afternoon, he goes and he picks up a bunch of workers and he gets them to work. And then in, in, in later in the evening, he picks up some other workers and he takes them back and they start to work. Well, when night is almost here, when work is almost done, he decides to make one last trip to go pick up these people. So he goes and he goes and he picks up one last group of people. He takes them back and they work and they don't get to work long because it's night but he still paid them the same amount. He still paid them a denarius, a day's wage, which a denarius in today's time is about $3.27. But then that was a whole day's wage. And of course, the other people that were there, the people that worked, that worked really hard for eight hours, that worked a long day, were upset about it. Because here's these people that come in and they only have to work a half hour they didn't even break a sweat. And you're going to give them the same amount of money as you gave me? That's not fair. Can you just hear it? Can you just hear them saying, that's not fair? And resenting those people and being vindictive and just wishing that, well, how? How is it that they can get that? How is it that they, they can come here and they can work so little? And I toiled all day. And they're going to get the same amount as my. I can just hear it. Because we all do that. 
We all compare ourselves. We all compare our issues and where we're going and what we're doing. And we just get so caught up with how other people are doing it. We forget to do a good job ourselves and get it done. But the man, he had something interesting to say. He had something very interesting to say to the people that were raising an issue with his payment. But he answered one of them. He said, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Man, that last line just stings the core, doesn't it? Or are you envious because I am so generous? Do we compare ourselves so much to the person that was so freely giving because we lack the ability to be so generous? And isn't that the crux of our problems most times? Is that we look at people who are so good at doing certain things that we ourselves are not good at doing. And we curse them for their generosity. We curse them for what they're doing. We curse them for all the problems that we have rather than taking responsibility for ourselves. <laughs> Thank God we don't decide what is fair. Really, thank God we don't decide what is fair. Because if we did, there'd only be one person in heaven and it would be me. And you can say that about yourself too. If I decided what fair, it's only me because everybody else just falls so short of the bar, right? When we compare, we set the bar so high and we say, this is where you got to be. And then everything else falls below it. If we decided what was fair, heaven would be a very empty place. Because we're foul, we're, we just have so many problems. We have so many issues that we wouldn't be able to see past those to have mercy and grace and forgiveness that God gives so freely. And you got to ask yourself again, is Jesus enough? We struggle so much with our issues, with our problems. We get a disease and we say, I can't believe this is happening to me. Why don't they have that? Why aren't they going through it? I've done so many things right. Why do I have to pay? You know what Jesus is asking you in that moment? Am I enough? Am I enough when you struggle? Am I enough when you don't get what you think you deserve? Am I enough when you don't look the way you think you should? Am I enough when you lose a loved one? Am I enough when you get a disease? Am I enough when you don't have any money when you're broke? Am I enough when you don't have a job? Am I enough when you don't have any food to put on the table? Am I enough when you have nothing? And that is a tough question to answer. I think we all would love to take that upon ourselves and say, of course, of course you're enough because right now things are good. But when things go down the pipe, we slowly forget that we should depend on Jesus for everything. And he's asking this question every time we compare ourselves to other people. He's saying, really? Am I enough or not? Do you believe that I have you where you are because I have a purpose for you, even though you can't see it? Am I truly enough or do you just say that? It's life just beating you to the wall and you're just down on your knees, bloodied and bruised, and you can still look up and say, you're enough. Because life is going to throw its punches. You're going to lose people you love. You're going to end up with incurable diseases. You're going to end up with lots of struggles and lots of issues. And in those moments, God's going to look and he's going to say, am I enough? And we have a moment we have to decide to stand up on our feet and say, yes, you are. We can't compare ourselves to other people because we will lose. And when we do, when we compare, other people, when we compare ourselves to other people, we are saying, Jesus, you're not enough. You wouldn't have left me with a body like this if you really cared about me. You wouldn't have let this person die if you really cared about me. You wouldn't have let this issue happen if you really cared about me. But that's what he's asking. Am I enough through all of those things? Paul, one of the greatest writers who wrote most of the New Testament, 
He's in prison, and he's writing a letter. It's called 2 Timothy. And he's writing this letter while he's in prison, chained to the wall. He says this. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. This is a really big verse. He's saying, right where I am, right now, this hell that I'm living in, the stuff that I've been through, all of the things that have happened to me, this is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for shame. The things I'm going through, the struggles that I have, the people that I've lost, the diseases that I've gotten, the money that I don't have, the way that I don't look, there's no cause for shame of that because I know whom I have believed, Jesus. Amazing thing about this verse and this book, shortly after he was done writing the book of 2 Timothy, he was killed. This was basically his, his last letter. And he had this to say on the way to the grave and on the way to spend eternity in whom I have believed. See, we, we ask ourselves the question, is Jesus enough? Is he enough? Can I look death in the face? Can I look lack of anything in the face and say, yes, Jesus is enough? I make the joke to my wife all the time. You know what? If you and I lived under a bridge somewhere and we didn't have anything, I'd be totally fine with that. And you know what? I mean it. Because I know that there's more important things to life than stuff. I don't have God figure it out perfectly and we never will. But I know that I know that I know that Jesus is enough. And that I can have nothing and I will still know that Jesus is enough. We all have to get to the point in our lives where we can ask ourselves that question. And without a shadow of a doubt, we can say, yes, Jesus is enough. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Do you believe that? Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Your problems, your struggles, your lost loved ones, your diseases, your issues, your lack of this, your lack of that. They're all small troubles that won't last very long. And yet they produce the struggles in our lives, the losses in our lives, the heartbreak in our lives. Those things produce a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever in eternity with Christ free from all those issues. But today, now, here, with each other, we have to ask ourselves the question every single day, over and over and over and over again, is Jesus enough? And you have to say, yes, and believe it. Because that will change your life. Having your problems fixed, having your issues removed, those won't change, because another one's right behind it. But if you, can, if you can look up to heaven every day and say, yes, Jesus, you're enough, that will change your life amidst the problems and the struggles. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. But the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Use that as perspective. Use that to help you understand that, yes, you're going to go through hell for a while. You're storing up a glory in heaven because of it. But the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Ask yourself daily, is Jesus enough? And then respond with, yes, Jesus is enough. I know, I know you're thinking, you're thinking that, you just don't understand. You don't understand the depth of the problems that I'm going through. You just you don't understand the amount of heartbreak that I'm, that I'm dealing with right now. You don't understand the loss. And you're right, I, I don't. I don't understand. But Jesus does. And he's enough. Look forward proudly 
with where you're going to be with Jesus through your struggles. And stop using pride to compare yourselves to other people because when you do, you will lose. We need to make ourselves daily try to be more and more like Jesus Christ. We need to live our, our lives free of problems with the problems and instead embrace them and know just like Paul in that moment that I may be headed towards the end of my life here, but man, in whom I believe, I will be saved. Jesus is enough. When you're dealing with the issues and you're dealing with the problems and you're dealing with the struggles, ask yourself the question, is Jesus enough? And give him the answer. I will proudly say Jesus is enough through all the struggles and all the issues and all the problems. Jesus is enough. Let me pray with you this morning. Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, I don't know the struggles of everyone here, but I know you do. And I pray that people will find you in and amidst them and that they will be able to say confidently that you are enough. Father, meet people where they are today. Meet people where they're going to be and help people see you over and over again through the struggles. Father, I thank you that you are a God filled with grace and mercy and not of justice. Father, I thank you that we do not decide what is fair, but instead you look upon us. Father, I just pray that you will continue to guide us, that you will continue to give us your grace and your mercy. And that when trouble comes, we will know that you're there. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to leave you with that same question. Is